Welcome to the Fancier Brew Podcast. I'm Andy, the Northern Diver. In this series, I'll be discussing adventure, conservation, and progression in scuba diving with some really interesting and inspirational divers that you might or not have heard of. The podcast is supported by Northern Diver International and you, the listener, through Patreon. So grab yourself a brew and enjoy this week's episode. This is series two, episode four, with Hugh Miller. So welcome to Fancy Brew Podcast. I'm assuming you've got a brew with you. I'm on two noodle soup. Are you? I'm on a proper soup because I've had too many brews today. So it, uh, okay. fancy, yeah. fancy a soup Wise. podcast. On caffeine, yeah, yeah, a caffeine-free alternative. Uh, I'm on Earl Grey. Oh, yes, <laughs> mate. I love it. <laughs> so do you want to give us a little um, a little insight into who you are for those who don't and never come across you? Don't give too yeah. much away though, because obviously if, if you give all spoilers away, it'll be a five minute episode done and finished. <laughs> well, I hope there's more to say. Um, <laughs> might not be. Um, my name's Hugh Miller and I'm an underwater cameraman and I've, I've worked really as a specialist in, in natural history. Uh, filmmaking for the last 15 years yeah I started a, as a as a as a researcher uh, on on planet earth um, the first one um, way back and then then I, I left the production side and um, went freelance as a as a camera assistant I, I never I always wanted to be behind the camera and so I, I left and yeah became a camera assistant and stayed a camera assistant for years, just kind of learning the craft, really, and then slowly progressed into being a cameraman in my in my own right. So, is that what you actually studied at uni? Was it? Uh, no, um, no, I studied um, I studied marine ecology. Uh, I've got no formal qualifications <laughs> as a photographer <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm the same. I've not got any either. So we're, we're in the same boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty common. That um so I mean I mean these days there are you can go to university and do you can go to university and do a wildlife filmmaking degree should you wish. Um but that's but that's relatively recent. And um, so, so in in the past, most people, especially especially with natural history, came from a, a, a scientific background and moved into it that way. But it's very okay. varied. I mean, you talk to anybody; that everyone's got a different story. So there's yeah. no. Uh, so yeah. what came first? Was it your love for being behind the camera or getting in the water as a diver? Do you remember? <laughs> I, no, I don't. I, I was always really, I was always really interested in in wildlife. And then um, I didn't live near the sea. I grew up in central Scotland, yeah, um, a long way from the sea. But there were there were locks and there and there were burns, and I'd spend all my time just you know paddling around, turning over rocks and fishing out awesome. um, mayfly larvae and, and things like <laughs> that. Anything that was kind of crawling around, and um, I'd borrow a, a camera and, and try and take photographs. Um, I, I suppose it was the wildlife first, and, and then and then the photography. But really, they became you know that they sort of developed at the same time. What took you into the water then? Um, I think well, I was, I was just always really really interested in, in what lived underwater. Um, yeah. So whether it was kind of the trait uh, when I was a kid, or uh, when I got older, um, and I realised you could go snorkeling and you could stick your head under the water and actually see things. And and watching wildlife films on television, whether it's Wildlife on One or, or Survival on ITV or, or things like that, and and the underwater programs were always the ones that captivated me the, the most. Um, but I had no idea how they were made at all. And then I I realised there was this thing called scuba diving, but I but. It, it was it was way out of reach. I mean, it was I I, I wasn't sh- quite sure who who managed to become a scuba diver. It just sort of it seemed out there with with I don't know, um, yeah, being a pilot or something. I mean, you know, just just yeah. kind of other people did that kind of thing. And then I, and then and then probably by by accident, I saw um, when I was traveling with my my parents when I, when I, was, I was probably about eight, and and I saw people learning to dive in a in a in a swimming pool. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the penny dropped. But 
oh, this is something that, that people could do and you could be a diver and you could go and see these things for yourself too. Uh, so, so from then on, as I, I, knew, I knew I was going to be at some point a diver. Um, I'd never dreamt that I'd, I'd make my living from doing that. Um, but, uh, and it was a really long time. So that was, you know, I was eight years old then. It was, um, I, was I was 21 by the time I actually got the chance to 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 learn to dive properly because it because it's it's you know it it's expensive <laughs> and you need time and, and you need resources and you need um you know equipment and, and things like that so it was yeah it was a that was a really that was a really really long wait worth mm. it though yeah I, I feel the same I, I was I was just on the cusp of turning 36 I think in my early 20s I had an opportunity to for a friend at work but the lifestyle that I had the financial position I was in, I, there was no way I could have sustained to the level that I dive at. Certainly, you know, the camera rigging. I've got quite a basic setup in the grand scheme of things, but it's still, I bet it's touching. I don't even want to say. <laughs> it's, no, it's okay. It's, it's probably best you don't. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and then, and then, you, then, you, then you jump into rebreathers and you think, well, I've got a, a twin set there. I've got a mm. single cylinder. I've got side mount kit camera kit and now I've got a rebreather that costs more than all of that as well oh my yeah. god what am I doing I, mean, I, I could have had a really nice car on my drive yeah <laughs> you really could nice you could yeah but it yeah. wouldn't be as much fun I but, don't think at all oh, I mean you know you go underwater and you can you can fly and you can see the most amazing yeah. things um, yeah it's definitely worth it um, I by accident when I was about 12 years old, still wanting to dive and still not, still being a very long way from being able to, I found a book in a school library um, and I started flicking through it and it had all these pictures of, of divers and it was obviously a pretty old book yeah. and I looked at the front and nobody had taken this book out in the last 30 years uh, and it just been sitting there and it it turned out to be The Silent World by Jacques Cousteau. Yeah. But I read this book from cover to cover over and over again. Um, and But there's a bit in it that he, in the very early days, when they're still trying to figure out how to build a, a regulator, they messed around with, um, they messed around with rebreathers, oxygen rebreathers at, at the time. And, um, and it doesn't go well for them <laughs> at all, to say the least. They're pretty lucky to, uh, to get away with what they did. Um, but uh, so... It, it, you know, discretion being the better part of valor. They they, they yeah. put the rebreathers aside and, and go back and work on the regulator. But I remember thinking, but there's a nice little description of this of this moment where, where they're diving before things have gone wrong. Um that that is it's there's no bubbles and it's all very quiet and the gas is just recirculating. I remember as a twelve year old thinking, that sounds really good. You know, someone should do something about with those. <laughs> I wonder if there's, um, you know, I wonder if there's a way of of of, of making those uh, the ones that work. Um, <laughs> and uh, and you know, unfortunately, um, yeah, fortunately they did. <laughs> I had a yeah. quite, quite a similar exp uh, introduction, sorry to um, rebreathers, like four or five years ago when I first learned to dive, and it was someone coming out with a local quarry. And they had an, a an AP on the back, so a big yellow box. And somebody who I was diving with, I think she was like one of the dive leaders or whatever, she's like, ooh, that's the yellow box of death. So then I was like, what's one of them then? And she's trying to explain it to her, uh, to me. And even then I was still fascinated. I'm like, well, it can't be that deadly because there's people using them. And, and then obviously I've, I've gained the knowledge and training yeah. them to understand why they can be dangerous. But everything's dangerous that we do in life, isn't it? So you just got to manage that yeah. and and with common sense and training, manage it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to treat it the right the right way. And uh, yeah, as you say, good training and good practice. And um, yeah, and keep learning as well. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm still changing the way I do things. I'm, I'm still looking to see, I mean, this is the thing that the sport develops, isn't it? And techniques develop and, and uh, you've got to pay attention and and change the things that you that, that you do to make uh, to sort of stay ahead. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how we were introduced through me training. So Kieran, who works on the same sort of site as you, he um, we met actually twelve months before. I didn't realise until 
just as we were leaving the other, the other weekend. We were both diving in Malta and his mate's rebreather caught fire while he was underwater. And uh, we met as they were like Ooh. dousing the flames and that and we're like, <laughs> nice to meet you, <laughs> see you later. But I, I didn't realise at the time who he was or yeah. what yeah. was going on. So um, I, a big thanks to him for sort of introducing us. So thanks. <laughs> thanks, Kieran. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Kieran. Yeah. <laughs> So spending such a time as you have done in, in the sort of TV world, for someone like me who's interested in taking my camera in and making short films and stuff, that seems like an absolute dream job. But is it a, a sort of nine to five, day in, day out, 365 days a year? Or is, how does it work for you? Um, I think I think if you'd get a different answer from every single person you, 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 you meet that might be in a similar field um but uh, but for me it w almost is every day even though even though the actual number of days away filming probably is about one third of the year um in an average year yeah. and it, you know it can be sometimes a bit less sometimes a bit more uh it could be a lot less like this year <laughs> <laughs> um um but yeah roughly about a third but and, and those are the days that you actually get paid. Um, and the rest of the time is, is actually taken up with all the problems that you have because you're, you're self-employed essentially. So you've got all the, the that business aspect to, to get your head around and deal with and lots of things that you don't want to do, um, like fat returns and, and things <laughs> like that. And, um, um, and then, but then you're also just, um, you're thinking ahead to future shoots and they often have lots of things that have to be done a long way in advance, even though they might not happen, uh, but you still have to do them. So it could be just filling in forms for visas or applications or, um, uh, you know, this, that. Now there's always huge amounts of paperwork uh, that, that go with every single shoot. Really? Um, and then, and then I, I work on the kit side of things quite a lot. So there's, there's, there's always something, new that I want to build and try out on that shoot so so there's that to work on and they and they always take I mean they they take a tremendous amount of time you know because whenever you're trying to build something new um 90 percent of the time you're putting into that is just failing and then eventually you get something that that, that works and um um and, and then you take it out in the field and you try it and then you think well actually you know, it'd be better if it did this or you know, and so you come back and you and you start changing it again. Mm. Uh, so there's that sort of thing. Um, and then you, uh, just reading around the subject and, and kind of keeping across what's going on. And um, yeah, it does expand to fill all the time. And you, you, you could you could spend every hour of the day um, yeah, pursuing it. I, I'm beginning to try. I used to let it let it do that. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I just full time every time. I didn't know what a holiday was. I, that concept was just completely, <laughs> completely foreign to me. I, I'm really bad at taking days off. Um, weekends were really useful because you could do more work at a weekend because you weren't incessantly getting phone calls or emails. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so weekends just became working days too. Um, and then, and then after, you know. A decade of doing that you realize well actually that you're you're burning out you need to you need to manage this a little bit better um so so the last sort of five or six years i suppose i've been trying to mostly unsuccessfully but trying to manage that a little bit better so i have more free time and i weekends at weekends and do take holidays and and you know that kind of thing so um yeah because otherwise it, it it will completely i'm still completely obsessed with it it's still you know i will get an idea and shower and you, you've got to write it down and, and um or something like that and um you know i'm thinking about it all the time <laughs> but i am trying to work a little bit better because i want to keep doing it as well you know yeah. it's just not just never enough hours in the day even if you had a nine day week it would still no. just fly well, by yeah definitely yeah yeah so i mean that's why i realized i mean even by you know just working seven days a week 12 hours a day you're still not getting everything you wanted done so just oh. kind of rein it in <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> take a little bit of time off rest um yeah do that kind of thing um yeah 
and and after she you know normally after she i'm 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 exhausted it just it right. just completely drains me um uh, some people are different you know some people just do back to back sheets and they just keep doing that i can't i just sort of kind of give the shoot everything i have and i just come back and i'm just a, a wreck i can barely sort of move off the <laughs> sofa for a few days and yeah have you found it a massive advantage to, to be based in plymouth um definitely early on because uh you, you know because because you've got the sea on your doorstep and, and I could dive and I still, at that point, you know, still training. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was really great. And um, Plymouth, you know, especially when you start and you're just scrabbling from job to job and, and things like that. So Plymouth was, was a fairly economical place to live, um, especially compared to, you know, the center of the universe for the industry, which is Bristol. Um, so that definitely meant that you had more money to um, buy bits of camera <laughs> and rebreathers and things like that. And um, yeah, um, so so it was yeah. So it's been it's it's been it's been good like that. Mm. What would you say was the defining bit where you sort of went from having a passion and a drive and a dream to do what you're doing now, where you literally made a, a significant step forward in that that path? Yeah, uh, it's it's hard to. I don't know if there was kind of a watershed moment, but there's there's definitely moments along 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 the road. One of the moments was I I done a masters in marine biology, and yeah. it was a masters of research, and you were kind of expected to do a PhD, go on and stay, you know, remain in academia. Uh, to be honest, I just I just wasn't that great at. at being a scientist um I, I i loved it um but there were lots of people who were just clearly much better at it <laughs> and i and i spent a lot of my time on the masters diving and taking pictures and i and i really thought well you know what that is that is something that i, I i'd really wanted to do um and i'd been really torn about you know do, do, I, do I try and carve out a career as a as a marine scientist or do I try and get into wildlife filmmaking and and it was and it was I was really torn between the two uh, so I thought well you know what there's no there's, there's there's no PhDs that really grab my attention so I knew if it wasn't something that was really really good I just wasn't going to be able to get through it I mean they're they're it's, it's tough and I'd seen you know I knew I'd, I'd have to do something that I was I was really really interested in I couldn't just go and and do one um, for the sake of doing it. Um, so I thought, well, there's no harm in trying, and I will. Um, I'll try this uh, path for a while and see and see if I can make it work. Um, so I got a minimum wage job at the local aquarium <laughs> and um, kept diving and kept taking taking pictures. And then I started making little films. I was really interested in time lapse at the time, and and this was kind of digital cameras were just getting better at that time, and and they offered opportunities for for time lapse work, and I, so I started time lapsing sea fans for a student who was doing a, a, a project on um, on on the polyps opening, um, and they, and they'd just been taking they'd been sitting there taking photographs every you know with a stopwatch every every 30 seconds and I, I said well I think you know if we just treat it like a time lapse film we could we could we could automate this and and you'd have a film and you'd be able to see you know when the crops opened and, and all this kind of stuff without having to sit here for for six hours a day <laughs> so you, um so I worked out a way of doing that and and it, and it caught the eye of the curator um at the time there and it, He'd been a diver for uh, for Cousteau back in the eighties, really, and he still knew people in the industry. And he and and a friend of his was a producer, and the producer was looking for someone who could find their way around scientific journals. He was trying to get stories for for a film he was working on. Um, so I got uh, really out of the blue. I got offered a uh, I think a, a six week job to 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 go over scientific papers and try and find stories and um and it just snowballed it just it, awesome. you know the six weeks just extended and then you know it just kept going um 
uh, for a year and then I realized that I, I during that year I got out into the field on on a couple of film shoots and worked with a cameraman and realized that that actually I could I could be an assistant and that would take me in a better direction so so there was another moment um and so I started you know that that was that was an important moment and yeah just kept going that must almost be like an apprenticeship to work as a camera assistant for a job that you want to aspire yeah. to be and you love someone who's who's already ahead in your field can sort of be teaching you and telling yeah. you stuff it basically is an apprenticeship i mean I mean, the one thing I could bring to it was that I was a diver and, and I'd actually got, I'd done my mod one. Um, and at the time there were very few people in the industry that, that were using rebreathers. And it was, and it was fortunate for me that the cameraman that I was assisting was one of those few people. So he really needed an assistant yeah. that could dive a rebreather. Um, so that worked really well. And I knew, I knew rebreathers were the future of, of, of filmmaking underwater. Um, uh, but it, so I could, I could, I could bring diving and an interest in the subject to it, but, but it was an apprenticeship because I knew nothing about the practicalities of making an underwater film, you know, with, with a big broadcast camera and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think it's really important. I really encourage people, you know, if, if they're at that point in their, in their lives and they can, and they can do that, then it's, it's just such a such a good thing to do because the bar is so high you know the the, the quality of the footage uh, is is so good that you need that apprenticeship really to to learn from people who are really good um you know so so you can basically just copy what they do <laughs> <laughs> i heard blaggerly that's what i just heard then <laughs> well yeah. that's that's kind of why I've, I've gone the route I've gone you know after four and a half years I bet there's very few people out there that have reached a point where they feel confident and competent enough to pick up a rebreather but this is you know this is the sort of the lines I would like to go down I know I'm a little bit long in the tooth com in comparison to your timeline you know you probably started in your mid-20s where I'm getting on 40 now so I'm behind the curve but you know you've got to start somewhere and give it a shot and you never know what's around the corner do you an opportunity might just come tomorrow that or we need someone with a rebreather experience to come and just hold a cup of tea for us i'm your man you know yeah. <laughs> and and that might lead on to something not necessarily regular and it'll pay me mortgage off but just something that i can get into and enjoy the rest of my life looking back going look when i did that one time because i could hold a cup of tea and manage a rebreather yeah 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 and the first few jobs that i ever did were 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 kind of really similar to that. I think I think probably the first job I did was actually guiding um, a cameraman and a, and a crew around one of the wrecks off Plymouth here because they just yeah. needed someone who knew the wreck and to just right. take them around it. And they were because they were filming it for uh, yeah just for um, some project. So that might be the only thing I did. You know, <laughs> I may never go any more than that. But you know, who you, no. you knows? I mean, what else does a camera assistant do other than I'm assuming that's it's, it's a really varied role actually um yeah. so uh, you know it, it could be as basic as just being on a rebreather and being the buddy in the water you know having the having having the camera woman or the cameraman's back essentially so because they are focused you know they're looking down that monitor they've got a hundred things to think about on on that monitor um and they they need someone to you know um kind of be their be their watcher <laughs> make they're sure not. they're not getting in trouble yeah um yeah and um or it could be a much more technical role i mean you know you, you still remain a buddy but you, you might be required to light um now underwater lighting is, is a whole art in itself especially if you're holding the lights um i mean one of the things that really sets the you know the big blue chip films which which is what they're called for some reason you know the big series they're yeah. called blue chip series um one of the things that sets them apart is that the lighting is is always off the camera you know you'll, you'll never have a light mounted on a camera on an arm that which is 
what you often see in, in magazines and, and pictures. Um, you, you, you need to get that light actually as far away from the camera as you can. Um, and actually just from an angle where it looks natural. So, so by and large, you want it to supplement the natural light and that's coming from right above you. So you give a light to a diver and that diver is, is maintaining position in the water column um, and, they're, and they're lighting. And, and that's a skill in itself because, and I did it you know, year after year, <laughs> hour after hour in the water, and because you've got to hold that position, you've just got to hold that, that, that moment in space and you've got to keep the, the light, because it can be a big light, can, you know, well, when I was doing it, those lights tended to be bigger than the, than the camera and the camera was big um, at that time. Um, they have got smaller, but um, you know, you've got to hold that so that the none of the shadows move because that will yeah. betray the fact that it's being lit. You know, you want it to keep it looking natural. Um, so you're moving around whilst that light remains rock steady. And often the camera person is is down on the seabed um, because they're trying to stay still and, and work the camera. But you're working like crazy, uh, maybe five meters above. Uh, you might be in current and having to hold that position for, for the whole dive. And it can be, um, yeah, it can be pretty grueling because you don't want to move that light if they're mid shot, you know, if they're, if they're rolling and you mess up and you know, that, that shot Sorry. is lost. Um, so, I mean, you, you know, we, we use underwater comms uh, a lot. Um, not all, not 100% of the time, but but most of the time, especially if you're working, if you know, if, if you're working like that, you really need yeah. you really need that through water comms. Uh, so yeah, you're waiting for that moment you can take a you can take a little breather <laughs> <laughs> and relax and scratch that itch that's been bothering yeah. you for the last oh, 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds immense. Um, I mean, I, I I have some understanding of what you mean by lighting with my camera rig, obviously. I try and put my strobes in a position to to sort of meet somewhere on the subject without lighting up the the water between my lens and my subject because it'll light up all the yeah. the bits of crap in the water. But that's for one sh one split second shot, not for perhaps five or ten seconds or even longer where you're trying to stay still and you you get thrown yeah. around everywhere. That sounds yeah. horrific, but yeah. fun, nonetheless. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, you really, you know, you actually kind of take pride in it. And I remember sort of looking back on shots going, yeah, that was, that was lit well. <laughs> <laughs> um, no one knows, but yeah, I, I look at it and go, yeah, that was, that was good lighting on that one. <laughs> awesome. Um, oh, brill. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the other things you could be doing, I mean, you, you, um, you're probably the only, as a camera system, you're probably the only person that's underwater at that point on that shoot that could take... Um, that could take some still photographs. Yeah. You know? And I used to take a lot of still photographs. Um, I just have the camera just clipped off for me. And often wouldn't unclip it. You know, you'd actually just, you wouldn't even look through the viewfinder. You, you, really? Something would happen in front of you and you just move it up and, and, and hit the button and hope you get something. Sometimes Shoot from the hip. Most of the time you didn't. But those moments where it didn't, you know, it was better to try and take a shot than, than, than have it sort of disappear. But, yeah. Um, but you, you try and work on your own photography and, and actually, you know, through that time, I worked on time-lapse rigs as well, because, you know, with it, with a still, stills camera underwater, I realized that you could take, uh, well, at the time, everything was being filmed in 1080p, um, on the big, on the big stuff, yeah. um, in standard def on, on DigiVita on the, on the smaller stuff, um, but with a stills camera, you could take what we would now call 4K imagery. Um, you know, your, your 10 million pixel SLR at the time was that, you know, was actually taking 4K imagery. And I worked out a way of, of, of doing time lapse, of syncing two cameras together at the same time and building lights, built lights from scratch. Um, and having the lights blink on and off. And actually, you know, I'd experiment here off Plymouth. Firstly, with, with lights, which were just on all the time, because it's quite dark and gloomy. Yeah. And then I'd watch the time lapse back and realize that all the animals just moved away from the <laughs> lights. Because <laughs> they don't, funny enough, they don't like having a light on them for, for no. two hours. And um, 
And then I realized that, well, hang on, these lights are gonna have to turn on and off. And I couldn't use strobes. I experimented with strobes uh, like you do on your on your stills rig. Yeah. Um, but the um, the there were two problems. One was the exposure level wasn't consistent between each shot. Um, and you can get much better strobes these days that are much more consistent. But the other problem was is that, is that, that that exposure on the strobe is, you know, a thousandth of a second. Um, and in, in in a movie, the actual um, the actual exposure time is much longer. There's actually a bit of motion blur. So, but if you expose everything on that strobe, you don't get that motion blur, and everything becomes very jarring and very staccato in in, in feel. So you need to use longer exposures and allow and allow motion to blur and animals to blur and and algae to almost disappear out of frame. Because if you've got a big bit of kelp that's doing this, this, yeah. backwards and forwards, it's incredibly distracting. Actually using a long exposure, you can actually just sort of ghost it and it, and it yeah. disappears. And the image becomes softer and much kinder. And um, But, you know, you sort of got to work a way of turning these lights on and off. So I, I worked out a way of doing that and hacking circuit boards together. And, oh. uh, and I did all that. And so... So when we were filming, I could also do these time lapses on, you know, if, if a project needed it. And um, and that that was my, probably the first sequences that I got into a film were, were, were time lapses. I wouldn't even dream of starting undoing any of the screws or fittings on this rig here, you know, and, and trying to make things work. I mean, obviously I'm very new to having a camera, so that's perhaps why, but I've not even got a field of engineering or electronics of, of any sort of understanding of it, so it, no. It like well, I, I didn't really either. <laughs> <laughs> I did GCSE in technology, and that's where my kind of practical knowledge has stopped. Um, uh, you know, funny enough, you're not doing a lot of circuit building on a biology degree, and <laughs> um, but when, but when I started work as an assistant, and I watched um, Cameron pin out the voltages on a plug that wasn't working on his on his rebreather yeah. and I say well what are you doing he says well I've got to I've got to you know there's a pin that's not working the current's not coming down here I've got to work out which pins which pin's broken so I can pin this out and he's oh, I've got a lot to learn here um you know not just on the camera side of things but just on on, on just really practical skills and and I think and that is that's been part of the joy of it is is actually you you're you're you know I'm a specialist in what I do but actually you have to be very you have to have a really broad suite of skills um, uh, to do it and the more you can learn the easier things are or, or the more you can do and the more things you can repair in the field um, so you know I I just went away and I just started reading books. Um, you know, electronics for beginners and um, uh, cinematography for assistants and, and you know, just I, I just had piles of books uh, that I just read. Some were terrible. Every so often you just got a real gem of a book that you just learned so much from. Um, and, and, and they were great, but just on, on all these different, on all these different subjects um, yeah. that would kind of help you on the next on the next shoot when something breaks because stuff breaks all the time um i used to dive a, a mark 15 5 rebreather which was the most incredible looking rebreather um i don't know if do you do you know it it's um no no I'm not, i don't know that one no. they were built in the um they were built in the 80s um uh, by a company they were built for the military um the the uh, they used to use the Mark sixteen in the UK. The Mark fifteen five was a sort of hybrid between the sixteen and the older Mark fifteens, and it was just a smaller version of the Mark sixteen. Really, uh, that was too expensive to put in production. But there, but there are maybe a dozen of these things that have been made, and um, and and two of my absolute heroes in in filmmaking were Howard Hall and Bob Cranston, and they both use Mark 15.5 rebreathers 
Uh, and, uh, and I really, really wanted to be Howard Hall and Bob Cransby. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I found I found a Mark 55 in this country. Um, and the person I was, I was working with was also using a Mark 15.5, so he had one. Uh, and so I got this 15.5 and we put new electronics in, in it and, and started and started diving it. It has a huge scrubber that looks like a giant donut that sits on at the top of, of the unit. And underneath that, the two cylinders with your gas are spheres, perfectly round spheres made of Inconel, which is a really expensive alloy. Um, with a wall thickness of two and a half millimeters, I found out later. They don't rust. They 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 have no magnetic signature, um, and uh, they sit underneath the scrubber. And then there's just this beautiful mesh of stainless steel tubing. There's no soft tubing on them at all, and it's just this web of stainless steel tubing. And it's the most extraordinary. They are the most extraordinary machines. They're also like trying to keep a really old classic car on the road and using it every day and that is hard <laughs> and they would break all the time wow. all the time um i don't i don't i one of the things i i, I regret is 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 selling it but i um i realized there came a point where, where I, I i moved on to a unit now I, I use a Revo now. I've used a lot of units over the years. Um, I currently use a Revo, um, and I realised that I wasn't going to use the Mark Fifteen Five again, and it was just going to sit there. And I thought that was a bit of a shame. And it should be should be dived by someone who had the time to appreciate it. I would have loved to have kept it, but I needed to pay for the Revo, and <laughs> um, yeah, it was one of those it was one of those decisions where you just think, well. Yeah, I can't really, can't really justify keeping this, um, but um, but yeah, there's there's definitely moments I wish oh, I wish I'd had Excel. You know, they're they're yeah, they're incredible machines, um, but all those drills you do on your mod one, every single one of those drills, all those boom snows, all those O two uh, um, pouring into your unit, PPO two going through the roof, or or, or the oxygen dropping, or things going and every single one of those things happened for real with the 15.5 <laughs> so um and i would rebuild it all the time and I, was, and, I, and I probably went through three completely different um uh, sets of electronics for it uh you know i was sort of a, a guinea pig on it for a long time and it was um so I learned a huge amount about rebreathers. When it worked, it dived beautifully because the lung it had this really small lung, which had this beautiful overpressure valve. So when you ascended, it just it just it just bled off gas. There was never there was never any change in buoyancy. Um, uh, it was yeah, it was it was a it was a cracking unit. But uh, you know, I, I don't. It needs most. Reliability. Yeah, and these must, and um, and ultimately you have to do something that isn't going to keep you up half the night trying to fix it mm. before doing full day's work under water the next day, and then doing that again, and then just hoping you're going to get it through the job. So I mean that just becomes unsustainable. You just need you just need a unit that, that works, and um, and the, you know the Reva has been a complete it's a complete workhorse. So it's uh, yeah yeah it's good. Sure. <laughs> well, looking through your Instagram, certainly. Some of the pictures seem to be where you are creating and building stuff, whether it be like some kind of mount for your camera, or it's sat on the seabed, or you've you've there was one of them I think you created a big boom. Is is that all your engineering, or have you got are you dragging in like other people to help you out with that? Um, some of it, uh, a, a lot of it's been mine. Um, sometimes, you know, production just wants to have their own kit. Um, I think. I think I really, one of the things I really tried to do was push the use of grip underwater. And by grip, grip is anything that you attach a camera to to make it more stable. Um, so, you know, um, top side, you put a camera on a tripod. Um, and I often put a camera on a tripod underwater as well. 
um, because you you can then put a thing called a fluid head which allows you to pan and tilt the camera very smoothly um, whilst you're filming so you can follow the subject around and you can just you can make it very controlled um, and then back when I was doing the time lapses I, I realized that I needed to get the camera very low and if you had a tripod and a head underneath the camera you couldn't get the camera low enough you know, a lot of your subjects are quite small and they're on the they're on the they're on the seabed and you want to get down to their eye level. So I started thinking I started thinking up ways of 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 a piece of of, of how you could hold the camera low to the ground like that. And and the obvious solution was to hold it from above and then have a, a piece of grip that kind of spread out from from over the top. Um so I I drew up um, I think called a quad. Well, I call it a quad, um, yeah. and it's just a it's just a tripod, but it's got four legs, <laughs> and the four legs oh. meant yeah, exactly, and um, um, and the fourth leg just meant that you you there wasn't a leg in the way. So you know, if you put a camera underneath the tripod, um, there's always a leg in front of you because. Mm -hmm. Um, which is in the way of your viewfinder and et cetera. So by having four legs, you can spread it out and I, I made it more of a, a table and, and, the, and the legs were on the four corners of that table and they go down. Um, and then the fluid head could be underneath that. And then you bring the camera in underneath that so you, you can get the camera in right onto the, onto the, onto the seabed. And, um, and that worked. And, and, and and that's been that's been copied lots. You know, there's lots of people using quads uh, now. Well, when I say lots, I mean like half a dozen. <laughs> Super popular. Um, I guess, I but guess it works very well. Of, there's only probably that many people at that level. Am I right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's more now um, because you know, I, I think I think there's always been a barrier to getting into it because of because of the cameras, you know, you, you, you could never buy a broadcast camera in the, in the past. Um, prior to the broadcast cameras, so I mean, you know, things like the big HD cams and things, prior to that, people were using film cameras and a, a camera person could own uh, a 16 mil film camera and they might have a housing for it. Um, but that was a huge, uh, you know, a, a hugely expensive thing to buy. Um, so, so that has always been a barrier to entry. Um, uh, it, it changed slightly when, when, it, when, it, when the HD revolution or all the kind of digital cameras came in and production started using, moving away from film and using broadcast cameras. But those broadcast cameras are even more expensive. Um, and, you know, it could be a hundred thousand pound camera and lens that's before it's gone into a housing so so those things were owned by rental houses and 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 um, um, uh, and production would hire them um, so so then you've got the problem is well how do you learn if you can't get hold of a camera like that how do you even begin to learn so that's when you know working as a camera assistant is is really good because at the end of the day uh, the camera person might say oh you know what you take the camera uh, have half an hour go over there film something and you get your hands on it finally and that's what happened to me you know I was on a shoot um, um, cameraman's tired he says oh I think there's a whale over there going to swim in that direction <laughs> and uh, so you take the camera in and finally you know you've got your hands on the on the on, on the camera and you can mm -hmm. see how it moves through the water see how it feels see you know how do you how do you focus? How do you, you know, what are you looking for on the monitor? All that kind of stuff. So, so those moments are really important to, to a camera assistant. Um, and certainly when I've, when I'm now working with camera assistants who have an interest in the photography side of thing, I, I really try and, you know, do the same. I try and pass on the camera um, a few times over, over the shoot so that so they can they can get hold they, they, they probably actually have a, a, a small still setup and almost all stills cameras have have video functions on now and um and you can get some really surprisingly good results with that but but it's still it's still different to to a, to a proper cinema camera um the way the housings if it's set up properly 
the way the housing moves through the water is completely different. Um, and that and that's and that's a real and that's a real eye opener. You know, taking hold of a of a camera and uh, and housing that's set up well uh, is a real is a real learning moment for for anyone who's kind of learning and, and, and trying to work out how to do it. So, um, yeah. It's, uh, Speaking of set up well, I, I like that picture of you where your camera's just floating in front of you and it's like you're checking one of your texts underwater or something. You, you're faffing with a bit of kit and you've oh, just floating. Yeah. Oh, that's my iPod. Perfectly neutral in front of you. That's like awesome. <laughs> yeah. You can get mine anywhere near that. I Yeah. So, I mean, that, and that's really, that's it in a nutshell. That's what I mean by having a you know well set up housing is, is one that you can just let go of and it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, one, it doesn't sink and it doesn't float. And two, it doesn't turn turtle and you know do a dead goldfish impression or something, or yeah. or points up at the sky or something. You know, it has to be, um, it, it has to sit in the water like that. And uh, and they don't come like that. You know, they don't. The housings don't do that out of the box. <laughs> um, like you, have to, you have to. You have to work. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, a mixture of of, of lead lead weights in the right place, and sometimes um, sometimes foam, sometimes flotation. So actually, you know, I have some big sheets of, of of foam that I can cut and shape, and and then I cover it in in epoxy, and um, so you can uh, you can neutralize things. So uh, you know, so often the monitors are can be quite heavy. Um, and they tend, you know, they tend to sit on top of the housing. So you've got this big heavy thing on top of the housing. So what's, all that wants to do is, is make the whole thing roll over. Um, so I like to make it separate. So I work out what do I need to do to that monitor to make it neutral in the water. And normally you have to put on the foam. So if you make the monitor neutral in, in the water, then you, once it's neutral, then you can worry about the housing. If the monitor is neutral in its own right, you can place it anywhere on the housing, and it doesn't change the uh, doesn't change the trim on the on the on the main housing. Um, so uh, you know, so if it was slightly buoyant and you moved it to the front of the housing, it's going to make it tilt up. So you want to keep keep it neutral, and that means if you take it off and put it onto your quad pod underwater. Your, your housing isn't suddenly going to sink or isn't going to suddenly shoot up either. So you have to kind of treat them separately. Um, and I, you know, make weights. If I can't get weights in the right place, I'll, I'll, I'll make a mold and I'll cast a weight and, yeah. and, a, and, a, and attach it that way. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's all about yeah, getting that, that housing to um, sit in the water. So you can do that. So you can, change tracks on your iPod. Um, no, I mean, it means you can, the housing moves more smoothly through the water. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a battle that I've faced a few times now where it's not been um, buoyant enough or been too buoyant and you just cannot hold that shot. Now I'm, all, like I said, we're only taking stills with that with mine. We're, so imagine trying to, for, for a yeah. number of seconds or minutes, trying to hold it in a position and you're fighting negatively or positively against yeah. it when you've got yeah. nothing else to fight against already right yeah yeah i mean when you're well kind of concentrating on keeping your position in the water um you don't also want to be fighting your housing and if you're fighting the housing then you're not going to get a smooth shot from it either because you know the, the lighter your touch on the housing the smoother that shot is going to be you know, if you're shooting handheld especially uh yeah you can get away with it more with stills, yeah, um, course, yeah. but I, but it, but if you can get it neutral and trimmed, then it, it certainly doesn't does no harm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to help, I think. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever look back at those sort of early short videos that you or films that you made yourself before you got into the industry proper and look back and go, wow, they're different. Yeah, uh, I haven't looked at any of them in a really really long time. I I probably don't want to i can remember them well enough yeah. <laughs> to know <laughs> to know that they were pretty terrible <laughs> but you've just got to start at, somewhere you've just got to do it and yeah just look yeah. at my youtube mate actually that's, that's that's awful enough you don't need to worry about looking at your own just look at my <laughs> i put out 
<laughs> but like you say, you've got to you've got to get going and sort of cut your teeth and find your own way, haven't you? To, yeah. To experiment with different techniques and certainly, like I made one the other day, and it was my first solo dive. Um, I'm a rebreather, and I did more of a, a vlog. You know, I talked into the camera a little bit more and dubbed over the top, and it's had a much better response than any of the other videos that I've done. The the footage wasn't really... better. It yeah. was just how I put myself across. So. I don't want to be in front of the camera. I just have nobody who wants to be in front of it for me. So I kind of do, got to do a bit of both. Yeah. Well, you're braver than me because I've never gone down that road. I don't know. I've thought about it and I may yet in the future, but as of yet, I haven't. <laughs> I find often these things just get decided Boy. for you because, <laughs> well, I mean, you, you've got to, you, you've got to get the skills and, 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 you know, um, I, the two most important tickets, I would say, are your mod one on a good on a good rebreather. Yeah. Um, I think you're on the JJ, aren't you? Which are the yeah. which are the cracking uh, rebreather, um, and the um, uh, and the HSC um, part four or commercial scuba ticket, uh, which yeah. is you know um, for people who aren't in the UK is the commercial ticket isn't it? that lets you work legally uh, as a diver uh, and and really those are the two I, I was really fortunate I, I managed to tag my HSC ticket onto the very end of my uh, of my um, biology degree uh, because the university here in Plymouth had a, had a had a commercial dive school and at that time it was the only school in the UK because all the commercial dive schools had shut down uh, briefly, you know, because their fortunes kind of just fluctuate mm. on the oil price, I think, because their bread and butter is, is, yeah. is, um, yeah, is, is kind of, uh, oil for the divers. Um, so yeah, that, uh, so if there was a brief moment where, where the university was the only ones left teaching, um, HSC courses and I, and I managed to get on, I, I would never have been able to go and, and pay for a course at, at Fort William or something. Um, and really that course was was a, a real door opener. I, uh, yeah. So I booked and paid for mine. Um, it's been postponed several times now. I've got it, like I said, the last two weeks of January. I'm doing it at uh, Bristol Channel, you know, with Neil Brock. Yeah. And I, I'm so looking forward to it, but with slight anx anxiety because I don't really know what's coming, although I, I know the course as such. But... Is it going to get postponed again? And I'm like, well, I'm managing mm. that disappointment again. But actually, it's going to be pretty cold at the end of January. Yeah, it is. If it gets moved to April, <laughs> I'm not really going to lose that much not sleep. too bad, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And I'm kind of looking forward to getting back on open circuit for just two weeks and then leave it yeah. again and, and go right. back on to the, the rebreather. Yeah. It's, it's been quite a baptism of fire for me because I'm really keen... On being good at what I do, I, mean, I don't, I don't just you know pay lip service to what I've been taught. I want to excel is probably a strong word, but I want to be as good as I can be at what I do do. So we'll just have to see. Yeah, well, yeah, that opens up some doors and some some opportunities to me, but we'll we'll just have to see where it goes. Yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, yeah. Well, I mean, as I said, the two most important. Well, for me, they've been the two most important tickets, really, and. Um, uh, yeah, I try not to dive open circuit ever. If I, if I can help well, it. I really don't like it. Yeah, Have you? <laughs> yeah. If it's gone, no, that's a good gone. moment. Yeah, yeah. I um, I, yeah. I remember selling mine, and um, I mean, you know, obviously kept the single cylinders and 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 all the regs and everything. Um, and uh, I sometimes I actually dive with a twin hose open circuit reg you know right. like something from the 60s um not one from the 60s a modern one one that one, you know one that works um but um because that keeps the bubbles behind you so it doesn't fill up your viewfinder and yeah. that, that kind of thing. but i'll try and use that if i have if, if i have to use open circuit i'll, I'll use something like that um no but i i actually yeah i don't i, I don't like i don't like what, diving open circuit me I expected it to be quiet when I got when I went on the rebreather, 
but I don't think I appreciated just how loud Open Circuit was till we did the bailout scenario. Yeah. And I was like, bloody oh. hell. And it almost needed earplugs because I got so used to it being so Right. Quiet. I'm so glad you said that because I've often talked about that. I, I remember, you know, I did a, I did a, a Trimix course, that, well, sort of the Mod 3, and you had to, I had to do a really deep bailout. Um, I, I bailed out for, for training purposes as a part of the, the yeah. test. I had to bail out at 90 metres. And it was horrible to go from this calm, quiet, closed circuit loop um, to this roar of gas. Uh, it was it was so unpleasant. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was. It sense? was. Oh, I, I mean, at that point, you, you know, when you inhale and you you just see the needle on the pressure gauge go down <laughs> on each inhale, and the instruction is just sort of, you know, giving the thumbs up. Just get up. Get going, stop. Mate. You, you cannot stay here. Yeah. <laughs> you have to start moving up. And uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah, and you got and you have to go through various um, gas switches and and passing cylinders on and off and uh, um, and complete a whole bunch of deco on on open circuit and then um, and then eventually you go back onto the loop and that was oh, such a relief. But when I'm working, you know, you're often down a spot. Sometimes you're working in, in places which are just you know, relatively normal dive sites as tourists coming through and so on, and you, you tend not to stay on on the on the on the busy spots. Um, but they'll you know the divers will come through and they they spread around and and they'll find and you can you can hear them coming, you uh, <laughs> you, you just hear this roar in the distance, uh, um, and it gets louder and louder, <laughs> and then they come around, and often and. You might be sitting on something that they that they would quite like to photograph or something. So you just back away, um, and uh, just 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 leave the site for them, uh, because you know you know they can't stay. <laughs> they'll be gone. They'll be gone in ten or fifteen minutes, and then they and they go, and then you and then you just go back and you start well, working again. Speaking of hanging around for a while, this is this is one that. I've not had the opportunity to in this series, but certainly in last series, I, I asked a lot of divers, um, how do you keep warm in, in cold conditions? Now, what I class as cold is nowhere near as cold as what your Instagram would lead, lead me to believe that you've been in. But I really struggle. And I've, I've, I've changed my dry suit for the winter to a neoprene. I've got different gloves. I've got a heated vest now, even different mm -hmm. boots and socks and a mm -hmm. better hood. But mm. you seem to dive, and obviously through work, some pretty extreme cold places. So, yeah. are there any hints or tips uh, that I might come um, across? Oh, okay. So, you know, if if I was working in Indonesia, I'll be the person in a seven mil two piece uh, wetsuit when everyone else is running around in a shorty three mil. Um, but that's because the work means that I'm on one spot often staying very still for hours and hours and hours and the water no matter you know no matter what the temperature is um it's it's colder than you so you will get cold um it, it's just going to conduct that heat out of you and especially if you're not moving you know uh, i don't know if on the revo uh, i don't know if you know it's got um it has a it has an orifice so it will it will just put in a small amount of there's a constant flow of oxygen that's supposed to be roughly at your metabolic rate. So the solenoid doesn't have to kick in all the time. You know, it saves a bit of battery and, and it can be used, you know, some people dive it in, in various ways where they use the solenoid as a backup kind of thing, which I don't. Um, but um, when, I'm, when I'm doing these works, I'm, I'm so still that my metabolic rate just drops and the partial pressure of O2 just goes up. You know, it's just, it's putting oxygen into the loop faster than my body's metabolizing really? it. Uh, so I have to block that orifice. I just, uh, you know, which is something you can do. You have a little, yeah. it comes with a little um, thing you screw in and, and just and just turn it off. 
and uh, yeah, because you're you know you're just not using it. So you, so you're not you're not generating any heat, um, and so you so you can get cold. And you might be doing three hours in one spot, coming out, having lunch, going back in, and just sitting on that spot for another three hours. And, uh, and, it, it can, and it can all seem fine in the first week of a shoot, but by week three, you, <laughs> you're, you're getting pretty cold. And uh, yeah, um, which I don't mind because I, I, I really suffer in hot places. <laughs> so if, in, if I'm in somewhere like Indonesia, oh, it's such a relief to get in the water and now I'm gonna yeah. get a bit chilly. Um, but then but the, the other end of the extreme, of, of the sort of spectrum is, is, is places like, uh, Antarctica. Although even Antarctica, the water temperature varies. You know, up in the peninsula, it can be plus one, um, which is in the water. I mean, it can be you know um, minus twenty in the air, but the water is always going to be warmer. Um, uh, it can be plus one up there, but round on the other side in the Ross Sea and McMurdo, it, it's a consistent minus one point eight nine or something, and. Um, and uh, and whilst that's only you know a three degree difference, it actually makes a huge difference to how you how you feel. So staying warm has been there has been an art. I mean, first of all, your your dive time takes a hit. You know, you can't do that three hour dive in the same way that you were doing elsewhere. Um, but I have but I have got those dives to be a lot longer than they were. And it, and not just longer than they were, but repeatable. So you, so you can do it twice a day, day after day after day after day, yeah. um, for weeks. And that, and that's that's very different to doing. You know, you, you could go and do just one really long dive, and then if you don't dive again for five days, you you know, you can do that. But if you but if you have to get in the water um, every single day, um, then then it's something else. You know, you, you do get. You, you do get really cold. Um, layers, layers, and wool. Uh, wool is is this you know is 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 brilliant. Uh, I've I actually I got stuck in New Zealand waiting to go down to Antarctica last year, um, and about a year prior to that, I'd been up working off off the ice pack off 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 Greenland. Um, and we'd set off in a, in a boat from Norway and, and travelled right across to the ice pack. Um, and before we set off in Norway, I bought these 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 kind of felted woolen mitts. Um, well, I was kind of forced to buy them because someone this 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 lady walked on the boat with a big basket full of them, you know, seeing a yeah. golden opportunity to to make a few quid. And um, and I you know I had gloves and I had mitts and uh, all this rest of it but you know these were these look very nice and I, and I bought a pair of these mitts and they were the warmest mitts I've ever worn they are amazing and I wore them all the time there um I was doing lots of sort of pole cam work and I was using them in in the boats and and I thought well oh, I wonder if I could make I wonder if I could make a pair of these to use underwater um and I I obviously use dry gloves but I had tried to I was going to use these lobster dry gloves these things that you you know you sort of splits your fingers and in, in, so you've got your thumb and then your first finger and index finger are sort of held together and then, and then your third and fourth finger are held together um so you're kind of you're rather claw-like which obviously is a big hindrance but it does keep you a lot warmer um and I thought well I wonder if I can make some some gloves, some wool gloves. So I was stuck in New Zealand. I went to a wool shop. I started watching, um, got a crochet hook. No <laughs> I, I taught myself to crochet in the delay that we had. And I made this pair of lobster woolen gloves. And I've never had such warm hands diving under the ice. It was fantastic. Uh, yeah, so um yeah so now i want to make a wool felted <laughs> wool vest and all the rest of it um yeah yeah that's ace i mean like, when you said you have to turn your hand and to different things and have quite a big skill set 
I never expected you to come out with, yeah, I bought myself a crochet needle and a ball of wool, and now I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never, I never saw that one coming, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've got some quite big gloves. I'm not, I'm, I'm not into mitts at the minute yet, because it's, it's clearly not a cold. And I've got some Icelandic wool undergloves, which are beautiful. They, they really are warm. So I'm not really feeling it at the minute. But yeah. my loss of dexterity is quite huge, you know, compared to wearing yeah. nice, small, tight-fitting no, marigolds where I can mm. touch the individual mm. button. So mm -hmm. I can kind of understand the need for a camera assistant's assistant. So there must be a big team behind you lot getting in the water to make your job. Yeah, especially yeah. somewhere like that. Yeah, you do need help. So you need you need um, you need good crew, and um, yeah, there's always there's there's always more people on 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 projects like that. Yeah, um, yeah uh, supervising the dive and and in the field as 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 producers and directors, and and you know they have to get stuck in and 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 help because you know you, you need help getting that that gear on and as soon as the gloves are on you lose yeah as you say you lose so much dexterity so you need mm -hmm. yeah you, you need help with that but um yeah and sometimes you know when you know, setting up complicated time lapses and there's and they've got small buttons that are all far too close together i've had to take a a rod down just to push buttons because there's no way i could get finger or my thumb in no without pushing sort of five buttons at, all at once um yeah <laughs> punching punch the button yeah. on the back <laughs> yeah nice. i mean that short of obviously you've talked about doing the hsc uh, pro scuba part four as it was known and getting yourself on a rebreather not so much for myself but i spy people who have had that lifelong dream and they're still in the the, the prime of the the youth you know they're coming up perhaps through college and university have you got any other perhaps tips that you could give them of how they would get into the industry that's perhaps more the norm now if they if they didn't know already? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I have to be careful what I say because somebody might change tomorrow. <laughs> follow well, yeah, one it will change, and, and two, someone might actually follow it. Um, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I think you know. Uh, I, th I think I think I think there's it's important to realise there isn't there isn't a certain way into the industry. Um, so if you um, so don't worry about not being able to do that degree uh, yeah, in wildlife filmmaking if 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 you if if you can't um, uh, because there's other ways. Um, uh, uh, do it if that's if that's going to give you um, enjoyment and um, but you know know that it's not the be all and end all because at the end of the day there is so much to learn it doesn't start with that one degree you know for for me I've, I've probably had to learn several degrees worth of of knowledge on other subjects yeah. since doing biology but biology was 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 really useful. Um, uh, so yeah, um, uh, keep, keep reading, yeah, keep learning. And I think, you know, it has changed a lot because, because when I started, you know, YouTube didn't exist. So now people can go and film things and put things out there and make their own channels and, and, and all this. And, um, and that is that's that's amazing at one level at another level it could box you in you know it will box you in at a certain level of of filming and um i do remember there was a, a dive supervisor that used to supervise on all all the kind of presenter-led programs and he, he gave me a good bit of advice that said you don't rush trying to be a cameraman because as soon as you say you're a cameraman whatever level you're at when you say that you'll forever be pegged at <laughs> right. so just take your time yeah and get better <laughs> um you know because you can make a living being assistant um and 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 just and just get better don't rush that side of it 
and that was and that was really really good advice mm. yeah because because it is a, it is a high bar um and then i guess on the other side of things is just experiment i mean the craft so what i try and do and and some other cameramen that i know and cameramen that i know do that they try and push the craft the best people try and make things they invent things they think of new ways of 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 taking a shot it's not just about going underwater with a camera and 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 filming um especially these days because if you go and if you go and look at any top side crew the amount of the equipment that they have at their disposal for making shots look good and slick and smooth is phenomenal and for years uh underwater the underwater discipline just you just put a camera in a housing and away you went that was it so so underwater filmmaking has been has largely been playing catch up um and it's made a lot of progress in the, in in the last decade um you know grip is 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 pretty universal for the right subject um uh underwater gimbals are coming through now these are all still bespoke custom builds being yeah. built by you know really clever people or teams of, of, of clever people um but this um you know but the but the equipment is is improving uh to get yeah to get to get shots that can sit alongside the types of shots that are being acquired top side and okay. look and good and look at you know <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's almost a good way of wrapping things up because what i wanted to ask you is some of the things that we've watched that i now know that you've been involved with are, are so highly thought of and so well spoken of and like you say this this blue chip production do you ever look back and go other than when you were when you were a lad and you went oh that was lit well do you ever think flipping heck i'm right up there you know like working for the bbc on was it seven worlds you've done and blue planet as well you've been on both of them haven't you yeah um yeah um yeah i mean there was a point where i i kind of worked on on all of them now there's so many that that some of them just just go by and you don't get a chance to work on them. but um because you're working on something else they all used to sort of run one after the other and now there's two or three all happening at the same time so um or more uh yeah. uh currently and um um so yeah i i think i have been lucky but i i don't ever i'm always thinking about the next shoot um yeah mega um, well thanks mate i appreciate you coming on I mean, like, you could have just gone, nah, I'm not interested in chatting to Ian. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think one of the things I've learned recently is just, it's just, you, you have to just have fun with it, you know. Yeah. Well, that's, that's definitely where I'm at now. I enjoy it. It's not breaking the bank. It's not ruining any relationships. I can come home. You know, everyone's happy. Yeah, because it can do all of those things. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> It's costing me a fortune to not wreck them relationships, so I've got to take my missus with yeah. me everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. Oh, right, well, I'll, uh, I'll let you go, mate, because I've kept you, kept you talking for quite some time. Well, been, well, well, thank, well thank you very much for um, inviting me to do this. Thank it's you. It's been great. Yeah. No worries, mate. Yeah, all the best. Thanks very much to this week's guest for sharing their stories and interesting tales about the underwater world. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did recording it. For more information on this episode, take a look at the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram for the latest news. Thanks again to Northern Diver International and those of you who have supported me through Patreon. Take care and I'll see you on YouTube.